Is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. So it's uh, it's my uh, pleasure. What? Not. Okay. It has to be right up here. Does it? Is it loud enough? Okay. Still not loud enough. Okay. Rakan, would you like to try yours? Yeah, it's, oh, this oh, is, this okay. is loud. Good. <laughs> Very good. Oh, Rakan, that, would, that shows the power balance. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's my huge pleasure. It's my huge pleasure. Would you like to? Hello, can you, yes. It's all right, you don't have to talk yet. I'll, I'll move this. Yeah, so, uh, first of all, to be able to introduce someone who really needs no introduction, Rakana Tuk from the Ministry of Culture, uh, who uh, thanked you all last night for contributing to this extraordinary Biennale. But the other aspect is that I want to thank you all for attending these last few days and for making it such a lively debate. We felt it was really important to find a time to reflect, not just on the present, but also on the future. Now, I don't think there's any point in talking about the successes, because if any of you were here last night, as you all were, you will have seen huge and amazingly attentive audiences. You could see it in people's faces. So there has been a reaction uh, by uh, population in Saudi, but also by people coming from abroad that I think has gone beyond expectations. And we will cross-question Rakan about those expectations later. But with his permission, uh, I'm going to try to pull together some of the notes from your different meetings. Because having asked you to give us feedback, I think it's important that we express it publicly. Uh, on the issue of success, uh, one of the groups summarized it rather nicely, that the Islamic Arts Biennale has challenged the idea of Islamic art as the past and helped bring it to the present. And that the very design of this Biennale, the contemporary, if you like, Biennale type design, has helped challenge the often uh, retardataire uh, presentation of Islamic art. There have been criticisms which we don't really need to linger on, issues of lighting, lack of seating, poor Wi-Fi, those are things that DBF will register for the future. There have been criticisms, I think, about communication, and one aspect of that is a really important one, and in a way, what's happening now is an expression of that concern. And that concern is that the Arabic language has, in many of the discussions, been secondary to English. Another concern about communication has been, if you like, the rather limited digital outreach. Um, but I understand that that's not the case if you look at Instagram. But um, I think um, it's, it's definitely something that needs to be considered. Another aspect of criticism has been that certain themes were not represented. Uh, for instance, the Hajj route, though we did have uh, the, um, uh, we had something on Dar Zubaydah, but I think more importantly, a sense that there wasn't enough on regional and local objects and traditions. In other words, a tension between local and global horizons. And inevitably, 
you raised questions about the extent of the field of Islamic art. Now, that extent is both kind of literal, you know, the geographic extent, cultural reach, and perhaps one that came out most in all of the groups, one about relig religious diversities. And the other aspect of some of your considerations was about disciplinary realms, the global contemporary versus traditional practices and historical investigations. But you were also asked to think about how this convening could help irrigate, fertilize the next Biennale. So there are a number of things have come out here. One is about public expectations, and I'm he here really meaning principally Saudi public expectations. So the question raised has been, what is going to happen to this site? A question you will address to Rakan. Will it remain a site as a cultural space? And what level of activity? Nobody is asking for it to always be at a peak, but don't let it go into a total trough. Then another aspect is what we might call the living legacy of this Biennale. And again, I'm provoking you here to ask Rakan about plans to ensure that this Biennale has a vigorous legacy in terms of conserving, preserving, and also initiating research. One of the features picked up in several of the groups was about how to pay more attention to the different demographies of audience. And I'm just going to give you one example here. If you go went into Al Madar, it was extraordinary how much people were reading. Whereas the normal, the normative approach in, in, in the West is actually just to have 200 words. And it was very obvious last night in photographs of people in Madar, Al Madar, and it was noted by the hosts that one of the things that the Saudi audiences in particular appreciated was th the amount there was to read in the um, Al Madar. I think this requires uh, further investigation and research into um, our audience expectations. Another thing that came out was with Al Madar and with the rest of the group, how much you've appreciated the opportunity that this gives for networking. But one of, the, um, one of the interesting things that came out of the Al Madar group is they actually would like a common theme for Al Madar for the next Biennale. I don't think that's what was expected. Um, and they actually talked about having a lead curator for that. However, they suggested that the diversity of all these different museums from around the Muslim world could be reflected in more diverse design, colors, lighting. And they asked for meetings to clarify the vision of Al Madar and its goals. So let me pick up on a couple of as aspects there. One is about diversities. And this was perhaps the single most common theme. People want more representation from other parts of the world as well as other approaches to Islam. Um, one group said we need to be able to express the diversity of Islamic beliefs and practices. If we look at 
how some of these things can be addressed in the future. One participant used a very, very good uh, uh, phrase, which was the tension between the Biennale machine and the time for reflection, for debates and dialogue. And I think there's inevitable that with Biennales around the world, you just get on with the next one. You're already caught up in the sort of huge activities required for the next one. So th a question uh, I think we should address to Rakan is, how can you find the balance between DBF as the producer of the next Biennale and maybe the Ministry of Culture or an expanded DBF as a convener for debates and dialogue? Um, and just very briefly then, networking and collaborations. This really has turned out to be a, a big theme for all of you. And one example of the success of that was within 10 minutes of introducing two people last night, or the, the day before, they'd already started on a project. So you should be the father of projects. Okay. Um, I think the other aspect that has come out is that whereas Al-Madar asked for a lead curator, there were others who suggested that you should dismantle the notion of each biennale as the product of a single mind. And the other thing to break down are the disciplinary realms. And so a strong advice is to convene, discuss, and debate with the artists, the art historians, practitioners, and the museum curators all together, not to fragment. And then finally, in terms of legacies, a very strong question about how research can be advanced, but also how the appetite of a Saudi audience can actually be fed and in schools as well. There have been amazing school outings here. Um, so how can, how can a Biennale like this uh, encourage um, uh, more teaching of history and art history? Um, and then, lastly, a sense that a Biennale cannot be neutral. Um, it needs to take risks, and I have to say, I'm looking at you, I, uh, you, you really did take risks, so thank, congratulations. Um, it needs to go for impact in a way that only spaces like this can. You have an opportunity that uh, most people will never get. So create that sense of wonder, create that sense of surprise, elicit emotions, heighten the senses, make it a once in a lifetime experience. Um, so that's not me, that's all of these people, Rakan. <laughs> so, uh, okay. so uh, Rakan, Rakan, may I ask you then, could you tell us a little bit about your vision for um, the Biennale and whether those expectations were met? Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I will speak in English uh, and we have some Arabic translation. Um, my voice is clear. Okay. 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 So I was just saying uh, I'm going to be speaking in English وأعتذر لل للي يفضلون اللغة العربية لكن الترجمة الترجمة موجودة إكراما بس لضيوفنا اللي من الخارج. Um, so 
the vision the vision for this biennale was uh, first not set by me <laughs> so let's let's get that uh, let's get that out of the way first um, the topic of Islamic art in Saudi Arabia and how this country deals with uh, with its own legacy in in uh, of Islamic cultural sort of legacy is something that is not uh, is not new to uh, government agencies ministries and leadership of the country I and mean, I will say that one of the most uh, profound moments of His Royal Highness the Crown Prince's first vision setting interview in 2016. A lot of my Saudi uh, friends will, will remember this because it was a moment where we all had a light bulb. Uh, in April of 2016, the Crown Prince, in a TV interview that he gave for the first time, pondered how can a country that is the custodian of Mecca and Medina uh, whose leader is the is named the custodian of the two holy mosques, not have an Islamic museum. And that's that's a question which, يعني, is probably even bigger than the ministry itself. It goes back a long time. This country has prided itself over decades on service to Islam. Uh, the building we are in today is a monument and a testament to that. Uh, the original building, not this cinema. Uh, and, um, and we know that as a country, we feel as citizens, as Saudis, as, as residents in Saudi Arabia, we understand the importance of Islam in, in this country and it's not lost on any visitor either. The Ministry of Culture, when it set up the Biennale Foundation, had an idea that a Biennale uh, will form part of <coughs> sort of one of the core building blocks of what is a thriving arts and culture ecosystem between support for artists in educationally or support for galleries commercially or support for museums patrimonially. A Biennale will serve as a platform every two years to showcase the art of the moment, or the th intellectual ideas of, of the moment. Um, that is what was attempted last year in Dir'iyah with our contemporary biennial, and that's what we will try again <laughs> uh, next year uh, in Dir'iyah. But then, there was always an idea that this idea of an Islamic arts biennial will have to be different. It is not to be thought of the same way we thought of the contemporary Biennale. There is relatively a playbook uh, to go from to uh, put together a contemporary biennial. It's art of the moment. You work with your curators. The location has to be rooted in some way to uh, or the, the Biennale location has to be rooted to a city or an extended activation zone. And forgive me for any not an artistic speak, but the Islamic Biennale was always um, much more. Um, so the foundation taking on this really as the first attempt uh, to bring back what I just spoke about and mentioned in April 2016, to bring back how will we really think of Islamic art Islamic heritage, Islamic contemporary art today in this country, given how attached <laughs> this country is to, uh, to this topic, this civilization, this inherited culture. Um, you know, I said to a colleague today who I met, I said, when we do open an Islamic museum, um, it cannot just be the best imitation of what existed 200, 200 years ago. It has to be something new. The good thing with an Islamic arts biennial is we're not imitating. And to start and to originate from a point of not imitating uh, was a special, special opportunity. Really, it was. 
Uh, we'll get to what will happen in the second edition and a few of Dr. Julian's يعني, uh, summary of, uh, of all of your feedback. Um, but uh, I have to say that it always felt special to start and inaugurate with the DBF team thinking about what can an Islamic arts biennial be in this country, supported as we were. So to, s to balance between audience in Jeddah and traveling from within the kingdom to see something for the first time, to balance that with an audience that we knew and hoped would come and partake and, and participate from around the world who've seen this topic over and over and, and dissected it and, and thought about it. And so to bring something new was, was really the, in the, oh, the most important part of the vision, if, if that's what we will call it, at the beginning was balance. Balance between understanding your duty to the residents in the kingdom that we ultimately want to help serve by uh, providing content for the school trips, providing an uh, engaging experience that brings somebody from Jeddah every weekend and not just for the inaugural weekend or the opening, the opening week, but also balancing that with our academic scholars, art uh, uh, you know, uh, lovers from around the world who will come and will see something new. Um, and then balance between history and, and the future and that, that kind of fa permeated throughout, balance between our wonderful curators, uh, <laughs> our four wonderful curators as well, balance between uh, the indoor and outdoor experiences. Um, so the vision was to uh, create something that will obviously draw and wow people. There is no denying that some effort was put in and a significant amount of effort was put in to make this a standout, memorable event. Uh, there, are, Dr. Julian said the scenography, will, you know, last year, I will never forget, we're gonna do some acrobatic, acrobatics with the scenography, <laughs> you know. Uh, it, it had to be uh, somewhat acrobatic, um, but then, we also had to ensure that day on day experience improvements were there. You know, things, they're not, uh, these are not minute details. The Wi-Fi not working or the wayfinding or the communication, these are very, very important points of feedback. These are things which maybe surfaced in the first month, tried to be remedied, but certainly have to be taken into account going forward. So I'll go back to sort of vision and what did we want to achieve? We wanted to achieve certain metrics. 500,000 visitors, يعني, alhamdulillah. We, we, got, we got the 500,000 visitors. <laughs> so we, we, yeah, we, we, we wanted to have engagement from around the world, uh, not just by people visiting, but by people going back and talking about this and thinking in a new way about this topic. We didn't, I, I keep saying, it's not thinking in the new way, it's thinking in a new way about this topic. And I think we managed to, as a team, with our curators, with our team, with our artists, and participating institutions, provoke. We provoked people to think about this Islamic art, this term that two years ago I, frankly, didn't like. Uh, but maybe today we can, we can think about it in a new way. So this provocation, which is less countable and measurable as the number of people going through the door, but certainly identifiable, I think we've, we've, we've achieved. Um, and then there is what happens May 24th with, with all of this. And I think that's always been part of sort of your objectives. What will happen the day we you know, turn off the lights? And what is ultimately the legacy of, of these 120 days of exhibition and, and two years plus of, of work? I think what we can all aim to do is to make sure that the, the provocation and the rethinking and the recalibration of, of a discourse or, again, balance that with the new 
insight and perspective that you gave to the 500,000 people to vi that visited. You mentioned schools and curricula. How we need to work, how do I introduce the wooden column of Abdullah ibn Zubair into the history books in the Saudi curriculum? Much like any famed object that you will find in, in another country. It's not. It, this is probably for us as a country our most valuable and for us as a civilization, the most ancient material object of Islam. It has been shown for the first time today. 500,000 people walked through the door and saw it. A few tens of articles talked about it. But okay, you know, what, in, in, in two or three months, how, do you, how does that transform into, it is part of what we as a country are proud of, how we think about it, balance that with what research grant will we as DBF, because we're thinking about announcing this, inshallah, very soon, will support the research about this object? You know, we, we already have our carbon dating that confirms the years, etc. But this is, a, this is one unearthed object that potentially has a serious, serious effect on scholarship around the world. And I think that's the point of pride we have that these things, especially in Saudi, we are a Saudi foundation, we are based in Saudi Arabia, we are part and born out of the vision program of Saudi Arabia, to feel that something special was done, not just to unearth and display some of these objects that have never been in the public eye, but to bring them to everybody from around the world, to have it be part of the provocation of this new conversation with them, and then to have an ultimately a legacy, both academic but also social, for the Biennale, not of just that particular object, but of the idea of the Islamic art topic, of the idea of visiting a Biennale, to have that be marked not just in the calendar of us who put together two years' plans of which art event around the world will we be, but the resident in Jeddah who knows that I'm not going to book my travel next year because I want to be here in the, uh, during the Biennale. And I think that hopefully all will build this sediment that slowly will stop being uh, so porous of, and you build layer by layer every two years on, uh, on the successes hopefully and learn from the shortcomings so that you actually have something that stands as an institution. And I think this Biennale especially this Islamic Arts Biennale, with a few additions, is an institution. I, th I think the applause there was not just for the extraordinary way in which you um, expressed the movement from a vision to actualization, but the act itself. I mean, it is, it, it, I think we're all incredibly grateful to what has been achieved. I just want to take one little incident from last night, and that was when um, beloved Mutlak from um, uh, uh, Kuwait, He's, uh, you can't hear? Okay. So our friend Mutlak from Kuwait went and spent an hour looking at people going into the Al Madar and looking at the Asabah collection. And he came out and he said, more people have seen this in the last hour than we get in a year in Kuwait. So that's... Uh, But this morning, you all met in groups to discuss ideas about the you know, possible ideas for the future of the Biennale. And it would be wonderful if some of you could comment on what uh, Rakan has so uh, admirably expressed, but also on your um, meetings this morning.
come along. You, you, were, you, ah, you were the most talkative group yesterday. Come along. Hi, Your Excellency. <laughs> okay. So I think also another common question, uh, or, or I, I guess topic that we also need to address or our people want to ask about as well, is the Saudi uh, kind of component in terms of kind of objects from Saudi families such as the Sabban family, et cetera, and how kind of these things really resurfaced after we opened uh, this edition. And what we want to do for edition two when it comes to that um, in terms of you know, based on the feedback that we received in terms of showing more works um, regionally and locally, so. So, um, I, I, I wanna be conscious because the, the answer I gave to Dr. Julian's uh, question was on the vision and so on, but Dr. Julian had summarized a lot of points which I, I, I would also like to uh, get a chance to speak to, but I'll answer Aya's uh, question first. Um, Saudi collections, um, you know, there is, uh, in, a, in a fairly uh, non-documented sense, um, many, uh, there are many objects of, and treasures of Islamic art, especially Islamic textiles and, and objects and so on, um, especially related to Mecca and Medina, um, within, fa you know, as family heirlooms today in, in private spaces and, and during, especially during uh, the curation and, and selection of objects for Mecca and Medina, this showed up as an opportunity. And uh, historically there has been hesitance uh, to bring these objects out, either because of these, uh, their owners uh, fearing um, their uh, expropriation in some way, or, or fearing to be proved, uh, prove, fearing to see what could be proved about their authenticity. So there's very, le there's, there's, there, the, the incentive was not there, uh, in a way, to, to bring these out to the fore, but there is a sense that, again, thinking locally about this Biennale, there is now an opportunity to have people participate with what they have, to have this foundation help identify these objects uh, and, and study them alongside uh, these, uh, these collectors. We had one particular example that happened with the Hizam of the Kaaba Musharrafa, which was one of the first Hizams ordered by King Abdul Aziz and made in Mecca that is on display in the Mecca Pavilion, which Aya, uh, through insistence, uh, convinced the family of Muhammad Surur Sabban to, to bring into the Biennale. Uh, and, I, and, and, I think, and I think that's one, hopefully, that can become a, a signal to others to, to come. I think Saudi collectors or private owners of, of these historical, religious, religiously significant objects um, are starting to generationally uh, evolve as well. Uh, so these are objects that are probably ancestrally owned but not owned by whoever uh, guards them today. Uh, many start to think about the legacies of their own families and to think about incentivizing and putting away to honor how they safeguarded and, 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 uh, and kept these objects, but also bring expertise uh, that perhaps isn't available uh, to them for uh, conservation and restoration of these objects and research about them, and then put them in contexts and in narratives where you actually increase their significance between a series of hizams or between a number of textiles and, and et cetera. So that's, uh, that's hopefully something we can do much more of uh, in two years or in the intervening, intervening period. Um, if I may, may I go back to a few? So, so I saw a bit of hesitance to come back and say the feedback. So I'll, I'll go to a couple of these topics. And please, Ali, use the microphones uh, to, to add any, anything. Um, I think the point on the audience liking to read in Al-Madar was amazing. <laughs> um, and, and I think let's 
as we take this feedback and, and think about what it means, we should also understand which audience was that. And is that the audience that was being introduced to this kind of showcase display for the first time? Is it an audience that likes to read because the objects are historical? Because as an audience, we probably think a lot about from the first question you, you'll find somebody ask is, from what year is this? Where is it from? Even me, as I, I gave about 40 or 50 tours uh, to, to visit, and that, that's, the, f that's the, the, first, the first two questions we get. Um, but then there is, you know, is there more, is there a s pursuit of a little more deeper context and knowledge about these, uh, these pieces? And we should, we should maybe do some, and we will, some extra focus group testing on how people dealt with these labels and these texts. You know, what were they uh, looking for? And so that's, a, that's a really, I mean, thank you for that point. And it's worth investigating more. I wouldn't take it just as a, as a headline. Um, on uh, diversity, religious diversity, um, geographical diversity, and so on, um, I think it's, it's an important point. I don't know that, uh, I don't believe that there was any um, restriction in any way on what we presented geographically. I don't think there was any uh, guidance on uh, concentration or allocation uh, by period or dynasty or, uh, or anything of the sort. I think in Al-Madar especially, as we grow and hopefully as Al-Madar grows in number of participating institutions, we will see more of a, show, a diverse showcase on Islamic sort of uh, historical objects. I think that can also apply to our contemporary works. Uh, I, I would like to see, and hopefully for in two years, we will see more uh, participating artists. We had three, if I'm not mistaken, we had three non-Muslim artists. I think diversity should include non-Muslims who are interested in Islamic art as well. Uh, let's not think in an insular uh, way. Uh, so, so I think we can think about that in, in the contemporary commissions as well. Um, on Al-Madar, um, so opportunity for networking and, and these ideas on should Al-Madar have a theme, a curatorial sort of line to or thread across, across these uh, participations? Should it have a more creative presentation format and design of the space? Um, I think these are important questions. Uh, I think it, pr practicality sometimes will collide with, with the best ideas, uh, especially if the number of institutions grows, which we uh, anticipate and hope for. Uh, as this sort of convening platform uh, grows and evolves. But ultimately, Dr. Julian mentioned questions on what is the mission? You know, what is the vision uh, for Al-Madar? And I think we've set out and our, our team, that, uh, the, the team that led on, on Al-Madar sort of communicated a vision which probably is worth revisiting given the success of Al-Madar in the last four months. In the beginning, it was thought of as a space that will convene institutions who have thought about Islamic heritage, guarded its jewels and, and treasures, and shared it uh, around the world, but to bring them all together to have a representation, especially from institutions that, in, for us in, as Muslims, for us as uh, the BNL team as well, feel did not have a seat at a table uh, that they ought to have. Uh, and and that's, that's really, that was the mission in the beginning. Maybe we have provoked enough for us to come back uh, uh, next year or in the, in the coming few months with a more nuanced idea and a more uh, ambitious one uh, for Al-Madar to not just be a convener, but maybe an agitator in a way as well. Um, so we'll, we'll share that with our partners, we'll share that with our potential partners, uh, inshallah, in the, in, the next few, uh, in the next few months. Um, there was a question on the site, 
and what will happen uh, on the site. Now the site, um, as you all probably know, um, was not owned uh, by the Ministry of Culture. The site was, we were supported in an immense way to be given control of the site as a ministry for 25 years. Um, so we own it for the next 25 years, inshallah, extendable, um, <laughs> under the same very forgiving terms. Uh, the site is a cultural asset owned by the Ministry of Culture, dedicated to do the Islamic Arts Biennial every two years, but to be activated in the intervening uh, time between them as a cultural center for the city of Jeddah. Um, there is a lot of questions on how do you optimize the selection of what activity happens in this site uh, honoring its history from 40 years and its recent history and frankly almost the sanctity of, of the location. We all understand how, how special it is. So there will be uh, guidance between the Dir'iyya Bin Ali Foundation and the Ministry of Culture on what kind of activities will happen. I do not anticipate from today until January 2025 when hopefully uh, the second edition will open, to have as large and comprehensive an activity as we've had over the last four months. Uh, I think the Biennale should, will remain the most activating of activations in the Hajj terminal, but not the only one. I think I covered some of these, so we'll yeah. give it back. Uh, thank you very, very much. I mean, they were I incredibly clear answers to some of the questions you had raised. But I know that uh, a number of you have uh, further questions. Uh, Jessica, for example. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to share some of the ideas that came out of our discussion uh, this morning. Uh, because I think that uh, they're very interesting ones uh, for you to contemplate and they came with very good positive uh, energy. So um, in the first place, I think that there's this idea that you have incredible space here for scale and that more could be done to maximize the micro to the macro. So going for scientific analysis at the finest, narrowest scale right up to looking at mapping the world like we also saw today in Adam's talk. So really trying to go to stretch as much as you can between those two, those two worlds. Um, there was a wonderful idea of having a residency program here in the curatorial area. Uh, I can see that the spaces that you have here would allow for something uh, like that. Um, and there's also an interest in seeing more of how some of these artworks were created uh, between artists and craftspeople. And I saw some wonderful videos when I asked about them, and I think that that making could also be part of the experience of the Biennale, getting people closer uh, to the work of art through, through making. Um, now, we had a word here, connectivity, again, not just connectivity between micro and macro, but connectivity between um, past and present, old and new, um, and um, especially connectivity between a place like this and the rest of the Islamic world, and the possibility of satellite research groups, where perhaps the team here would travel to Timbuktu and work uh, closely with the library there, and then the kinds of works that are then put on display here would reflect the wonderful work research done by Saudi uh, students, researchers, uh, perhaps also foreign researchers if you wished, but I think it could also be a local program that goes global. Um, and um, a lot of interest in really developing the immersive for the rest of us. 
uh, you have possibilities here that are impossible to experiment with in smaller spaces. So perhaps experimenting and leading for us so that we could uh, build on your efforts uh, to experiment. A uh, special interest in emotions and senses. Um, and again, um, you know, going to the, from the intimate um, to the enormous, looking at the local, regional, and international. Object speaking, the possibility of inscriptions that come to life and that you can hear. Um, soundscapes and things of that sort have already been explored. Uh, but also moving objects, the kind of thing that we've seen in some museums where uh, miniature paintings come alive and tell you the story as a comic book would. Um, making is especially important, and there was a great deal of interest in further study on, for example, the making of the tombstones. So they could come back again in two years, but with an entirely different approach that would teach us about the stone, how it was done, how it's related to other stone working traditions uh, and to making traditions elsewhere in the Islamic world. A special uh, mention to plan ahead <laughs> because all of us would like to be on board and we would like to have the time to be able to give our very, very best. And there was a keen interest on focusing even more on Jeddah, the city of Jeddah and its history over, over the, the centuries and even millennia, and um, really to look at its local knowledge from an anthropological storytelling perspective and being able to bring that uh, to the visitor. And um, finally, uh, really to think about civilization and um, somebody, uh, not just Islamic art, but civilization, all the things that go along with it. And uh, finally, we had uh, this word, which I'm going to allow my colleagues to help me with. Uh, it first was pronounced as agora, which of course is the Greek word, that this place had acted like that. And then we came across the word majlis. And uh, then we also have this beautiful Arabic word, which somebody else felt could be best explain what the, this is majlis also. Yeah. Oh, I thought someone said nej, wasn't it? Nadwa. Nadwa was the other word that people felt could be associated with this space. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to Jessica's wonderful summary. Was what also struck me was how many people in the space wanted to have opportunities for people in different parts of the is Islamic hegemonic world to participate in this kind of experience, especially if they can't travel. And I think that one of the opportunities of this central site is not only to have everything centralized, but to have a means of enabling others to also create spaces of ac cultural activation, um, such as you were talking about, so that there a paradigm can spread. So it isn't a single Islamic art biennial which has to cover everything as an overview, but is a living practice of art within Islamic hegemonies which people can activate locally as well. And there was a lot of interest, as um, Jessica said, in emphasizing the local here, but also in being able to articulate the local in its multiplicity. And I think that that um, multiple activation is so central to the idea of Islam in its diversity that also comes together in this geography. And so it sort of gives a nice reflection to a more conceptual notion of Islam in its rel religious manifestation, but also as that becomes a dynamic, or functions as a dynamic culture with local specificities. Uh, thank you very much, and I, I, I think the bo both both were um, very important comments. And I, I'll, I'll just catch on this connectivity idea, but also how do you think about different places and access and enabling people to have localized ideas of what this Biennale probably brought uh, brought as a th way of thinking and so on and uh, in the legacy. And I remember in the f opening week, 
uh, when when the first questions being posed on uh, we were being posed to us were on uh, contemporary and historic and and things like that and and this idea of collapsing and I li you know I like using the word collapse because other scholars have used it to mean something else about Islamic civilization but collapsing in space geographically between sort of furthest reaches of, of what is uh, the Islamic world and I remember one of our, my co-panelists thinking about the edge and the periphery of of the periphery and the center of, of Islamic culture and that the peripheries today are the potentially these migrant immigrant Muslim commu minority communities also in non-Muslim in non-Muslim countries but to bring the, all of these back in in, um, in a way to face to face with local Muslim populations in, in Jeddah or in, in uh, everywhere else, practitioners, Muslim cultural practitioners and creatives and craftspeople and so on. In the same way that you collapsed the temporal side of what is Islamic uh, art and you know you brought together uh, the tombstones with, uh, with the contemporary commissions and, and etc. And I think to have the Biennale every two years as the moment where you refreshed people's sense of coming face to face with historical uh, ideas and lineages of, of their own uh, current cultural and artistic practice, or to identify points of cross-pollination that have happened across centuries and continue to happen today is, is something that's extremely powerful, and that connectivity will be enabled in a big way by having, in a large way, by having local, I would say, opportunities and, and uh, experiences and maybe these smaller micro convening moments across different places around the world, uh, which bring in, which come with the same spirit of what we try to do every two years, but in a more um, practical and, and frankly easier uh, way to, uh, to do, reliant on the cultural practitioners and, and creatives themselves to lead where this goes and how they use it. And I think that's, a, that's an important point that should go a lot into how we think about the Islamic Arts Biennale programming in the inter-Biennale period between, between the different uh, editions. So thank you. Some questions from al Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أتحدث يعني باللغة العربية لو سمحتم أنا من ما من مالي ماهد أحمد بابا للدراسات الإسلامية بتنبكتو فقط يعني عندي ملاحظة عندنا هنا عند عندكم هنا في السعودية طلاب يعني من دول شتى وهؤلاء الطلاب سفراء لدولهم سابقا كانوا يدرسون الدراسات الإسلامية فقط واليوم هناك يعني الدول الدول تطورت وتقدمت يعني في دراسة دراسات الفنون الإسلامية هؤلاء أنا أريد يعني أن تعطيهم فرصة فرص ليدرسوا هذه الفنون حتى إذا رجعوا إلى بلدانهم يحفظوا يحتفظوا عليها ويكونوا سفراء يعني ها للحفاظ على هذا التراث الإسلامي الموجود يعني هناك موجود كثير يجح الحضارة الإسلامية غنية يعني بشكل غريب يعني أنا رأيت أشياء هنا يعني في هذا البينال يعني متشابهة عندنا موجودة في تنبكتو في جاو في بعض الدول الإسلامية في في غرب إفريقيا موجودة لكن الناس ما عندهم وعي يعني لدراسة هذا هذه الآثار والاهتمام بها إذا نرجو يعني منكم يعني أن تساعدوا الطلبة يعني والمراكز أيضا في للحفاظ على هذه هذا التراث شكرا ال ال ألف شكر العفو شكرا لك وصراحة معهد أحمد بابا بالذات إحنا ممنونين بشكل كبير لمشاركتكم وجود المعهد في المدار هذه السنة كان من يعني خلينا نقول فتح بصيرة المؤسسة ولكن أعتقد كثير من زوارنا كذلك على أهمية المعهد تراثه في المحافظة على المخطوطات دوره المحوري في دخول الإسلام إلى قارة أفريقيا 
آه فشخصيا انا تعلمت من تواجدكم آه ناهيك عن زوارنا آه وما استفادوا وطرحت نقطه مهمه جدا جدا آه فعلا المملكه اليوم آه فيها كثير من طلبه الجامعات من دول حول العالم في جامعات في الجامعات السعوديه اعتقد ان دراسات الفنون وبالذات تاريخ الفنون الاسلاميه مو قابله لانها تطور في مناهج جامعاتنا موجود الحمد لله ارث علمي واكاديمي ممتاز بالذات في الاثار بوجود يعني اساتذتي الدكاتره اللي مختصين في الجامعات والشق التعليمي والبرامج التعليميه في المملكه يمكن يعني اخذ النقطه هذه ونترك النقاش لهم لكن اعلم ان في وزاره الثقافه عمل دؤوب وليس ببسيط في فكره ادراج مناهج الفنون ليس فقط في الجامعات ولكن حتى في التعليم العام في المدارس وربما ان هذا البيانالي وكثير من الانشطه الثقافيه اللي والبرامج الثقافيه اللي تعمل عليها وزاره الثقافه كجزء من الاستراتيجيه الوطنيه للثقافه يعني تحفز الجامعات بالذات في الجامعات اللي بها طلاب غير سعوديين للمشاركه ليستفيدوا ولا نستفيد احنا من تواجدهم لان زي ما تفضلت هم سفراء من دول اخرى كذلك فيحملون يعني كثير المعرفه اللي ممكن يفيدون فيها الطلبه السعوديين في هذه الجامعات فشكرا جزيلا لمداخلتك. هو تجربة إتاحة الفرصة للطلاب العرب والمسلمين أنهم يقدموا دراسات عليا في الجامعات السعودية وعندنا تجربة في جامعة الملك سعود قسم الآثار والمتاحف رئيس القسم هنا معنا وكذلك في الجامعة جامعة أم القرى وأعتقد أن الجامعة الإسلامية تمر بمرحلة تطوير الآن وانفتاح على الفنون وعلى التراث ولا لا شك انه اخواننا من مالي ومن اي دول اسلاميه عندما يدرسون اللغه العربيه عندنا وينخرطون في دراسات عليا فتكون التعاون مشترك والثقافه المشتركه. السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته او اولا احيي الاستاذ راكان واحيي الحضور الكرام وبس حبيت مداخله للاخ اللي يسال عن هذا الموضوع بالذات انا رئيس قسم الاثار في جامعه الملك سعود طبعا جامعه الملك سعود تحتوي زي اي جامعه معهد لغه عربيه ثم يتخرج الطلاب من معهد اللغه العربيه جميع من اقطار جميع الدول الاسلاميه بكافه حتى الغربيه يعني يتعلمون اللغه العربيه ونعطيهم الفرصه أن يدرسوا الماجستير والدكتوراه إن أرادوا الذي معه مثلا البكالوريوس يكمل ماجستير ودكتوراه والذي ليس معه بكالوريوس يكمل بكالوريوس ثم ماجستير ودكتوراه أذكر من الرسائل التي نوقشت في القسم هي المصاحف التمبكتية الذي يتكلم عنها وهي موجودة ومخرجة الآن في قسم الآثار والآن كثير من الدول الإفريقية قبلناهم في البرنامج في الماجستير والدكتوراه والآن هم في هذا البرنامج فالفرصة معطى لجميع من في العالم ندرس شكرا So I think at this point uh, we have to close and so can I ask you all to uh, first of all thank uh, Rakan for uh, a wonderful um, exposition. Thank you all. Thank you and, all. And, and, and thanks to everybody in DBF. And one last thanks. One of the most wonderful aspects of this has been to see how the young hosts who knew absolutely nothing, nothing about the material here. <laughs> I think some of them, it's transformed their own individual lives, but I'm hoping that some of them will go on to be professional guides and somehow manage, after standing for 10 hours a day, still be smiling and full of information and love. So. Really a huge thanks to them.